Would you pray for me and with me now as I speak words of prayer? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this morning and always. For you are the source of our strength. You are the rock of our redemption. You are indeed worthy of our praise. Amen. Uh, beginning this morning and continuing over the next several Sundays, we're going to spend some time, as we generally do at this time of year, at least those of us who submit ourselves to the discipline of the lectionary, this three-year cycle of readings from God's Word, which seek to introduce us to the breadth and length and height and depth to the totality of Holy Scripture. Beginning this morning and over the next several Sundays, we're going to spend some time huddled with the Christians who gathered in the Greek city of Corinth, sharing, as they do, as we do, a wide diversity of opinion and personality, style, and background. We'll share with these ancient men and women and with the Apostle Paul, their mentor as well, who searches along with them as we search for commonality, for oneness, for unity in the midst of our diversity, a unity revealed in the person of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Corinthian church mirrored many of the same factors that are at work in the church today, insofar as both institutions and movements are ones that seek after God's love and justice in a world filled with injustice and violence, with constant change and confusing diversities. The city of Corinth was, and continues to be, a seaport located around 50 miles southeast of Athens, Athens the capital of Greek culture. Corinth is a commercial and cultural hub strategically located on an isthmus between two larger land masses, those that make up the southern end of the nation of Greece. Ancient Corinth was the home to artisans, to potters and weavers and met metal workers, and it was also a place where soldiers and sailors and other travelers found home away from home, bringing along with their beings and their belongings a variety of religious backgrounds and traditions. And so, although modern archaeologists have found evidence in excavations of Corinth of Egyptian and Greek religions, as well as shrines and structures dedicated to the Roman cult, there was also a large and strong community of Jews in Corinth, a community in the midst of which these Jesus followers had taken root and from which they sprang and spread. Corinth, then, in the time of Paul, was an economically thriving, dramatically multicultural and multi-religious community, one with much social stratification, meaning that those who were very rich were widely separated from those who were very poor, with a deep and broad class of folk in between. That sounds very familiar to those of us who live in 21st century Western culture. Two, the Church of Corinth reflected that wider cultural and educational and social environment. That is to say, there were all kinds of folk in the Corinthian church, a few on the high end of the economic scale, a few on the low, and many others in between, those whom we would consider today to be of working class. In the Corinthian culture, just as is true today, one's social status and material wealth played a strong role in how one was seen in the culture, in the world, in the church. The rich enjoyed the judicial system's protection and they were well served by the political structure of the day, while the poor were often fleeced and abused, left behind, left out, left for dead. The church, too, while it was more egalitarian than the rest of society, even in the church, the rich were valued for their wealth, for their position, for their social status and standing. Into this situation of diversity and disparateness then came Paul, speaking to the people about spiritual gifts, as our trend puts it, or perhaps more accurately about matters of the Spirit. Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, was given to the church by God, according to Paul, to stir up faith among its adherents, and not just those in the church itself, but also in the city, in the culture around them. And so this spirit was made manifest, made evident and real, not only in the words which the Corinthian Christians used in worship, Jesus is Lord being the earliest and tersest of the ancient creeds, but also in the deeds of love and justice, inclusion and expansion, those which the church did and continues to do in the wider world. 
Paul writes. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates them in everyone. Paul's point here seems to gifts of the Spirit, many and various as they are, are just that, not talents or abilities stirred up from within one and, and developed by one's own character, but gifts given to the church and to its participants from without, given by God for the purpose of building up and maintaining the common good, of spreading the euangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son, the sovereign one of God. Thus, wealth and power, political strength and economic might, though they might seem to us to be desirable, don't necessarily convey importance or blessedness or preference upon those who possess them. Rather, each one of them, each one of us, whether rich or poor, male or female, young or old, powerful or powerless, each one is gifted by God and activated by the Spirit so that all are uniquely necessary for the health and hold for the holiness of the whole. Several months ago, I talked about our bell choir being an example of diverse gifts being used for a common purpose. I want to focus your mind today on the praise band at 845 or at 1107, composed at 845 of five or six or seven people, several vocalists, a bass player, a guitarist, Ron Kratchik, who leads the group, uh, uh, Nancy at the piano, and, and a drummer. Without any one of those people, the praise band would not be complete. When they're all here, they make beautiful music. When someone's absent because of illness or travel or a Buckeyes game the night before, the music suffers. It's good, but it suffers. It's not complete. It takes every one of those members. It takes every one of these members in this choir. It takes every one of these members in this choir to make sure that the music is complete and and blessed and honoring. Well, in the gospel lesson before us today from John's story of our Lord's life, we get a sense of the radically egalitarian nature of this good news which Paul commended and Jesus embodied. Here at the very begin of, beginning of his account, John tells a story about Jesus and the disciples attending a wedding feast, one where Jesus is invited by his mother to resolve an issue which could have resulted in a collapse in the host's social standing. They have no wine, Jesus' mother says to her son. It's interesting to me, at least, that in John's gospel, she is never re referred to by her name. And though Jesus is somewhat petulant in his response, still she persists in faith that he can do something about the situation do whatever he tells you, she says perceptively. It's a and an insight to which we might pay attention as well. And so Jesus instructs the servants, who are in on the joke in a way that the higher folk in the room are not, Jesus instructs them to fill several large jars of water drawn from the community well, and then to take the now filled to the brim jars to the chief steward. When the steward tastes the water that had become wine, as the gospel writer Riley puts it, the steward praises the host for undercutting social convention once again by saving the very best for last. John calls this a sign, an event, an experience that reveals in this gospel something epiphany-like something surprising about the character of God. It was the very best gifts to all, rich and poor, male and female, powerful and powerless, respectable and not so respected. To each, the apostle writes, is given a manifestation that is an epiphany of the spirit for the common good. Thus, it is that each one of us and all of us together in all our disparateness and diversity, each one of us bears on his or her being some essential aspect of the divine character, some evidence of the image of God implanted within us in creation and revealed to us in baptism. 
the nations shall see your vindication, the prophet Isaiah cries, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, a name that the Lord will give you. No longer forsaken, but delightful, or desolate, but married, fruitful, fecund, fertile. No longer divided and separated and stratified, but invited, inviting, activated by a single spirit so that we might carry out our common calling, that of proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord of all and of living in this world as if his lordship were already made complete and real. Many gifts, one spirit, one love, shown in many ways, from diversity is blessing. In our diversity, we praise one giver, one Lord, one spirit, one word, known in many ways, hallowing our days for the giver, for the gifts. Praise, praise, praise. The words of Israel's psalmist draw to a conclusion this sermon. In the 36th of the ancient songs, the poet pens a prayer, one which will serve today as our own. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds, your righteousness like the mighty mountains, your judgments like the great deep. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of delight. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who love you, and your salvation to the upright. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we prepare now to share together in a time of prayer, please allow me to name before you those persons for whom we have particular concern as we pray this day. We think of Freddie Shear, who has recently been transferred from uh, Akron City Hospital to Smithville Western Care Center. We're lifting before God Francis Freshly. Francis is our Worcester United Methodist Church Person of the Week, and her name is in the folders this morning and address for your uh, cards and notes of encouragement. As I mentioned a while ago, the altar flowers, the beautiful roses on the altar have been given by the Michael Tefts family in celebration of Anna's 11th birthday this Thursday. Is it Thursday? This Thursday. When is your birthday? This Thursday. Nobody is going to forget this now. This Thursday. Would you join me now in a moment of silence as we prepare ourselves to be open to the presence of God who leads us by the Holy Spirit to the royal throne. O oh God, your faithfulness and righteousness go beyond all boundaries and borders. Your love expands to cover all peoples in the warmth of your embrace. We come before you this day ready, willing, and able to feast on the abundance of your grace. Your steadfastness overshadows us. Your strong arms encompass us. Your gracious hands hold us fast. Because of this, we join together in singing and speaking and shouting your praise as we lift our heads and hands and hearts to the wonder and glory of your name. Your love for us is in fact so deep and so vast that you have given us a new name so that we might no longer be found among those who are forsaken, but 
but we fail to answer you when you call us delightful. You love us as your own beloved children. You call us married, but time and again we are unfaithful to you and to one another, to your will and word and way. But because of your steadfast love, your abundant mercy, you forgive us for all our sin. By your amazing grace and abiding peace, therefore, make us into shining torches of glory that you might take delight in us once again. In your infinite wisdom, you have given to your church a variety of gifts, all made active by the same Holy Spirit. Give to us then a fresh measure of that same Spirit this day, that we might join your people and all of the created order in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord of all. As we celebrate the wine of gladness this day, we also lift before you those who drink from bitter cups of affliction. Uplift with your presence those who have no cause for rejoice and relieve the physical and psychological suffering of all who are in pain, granting to them and to us your grace and your peace. O fountain of life, fill our cups and answer these prayers, which we have offered in the name of Jesus Christ, our sovereign and savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 